Hey, greetings students of Luceo Salvamini. Uh, it is me, Chris Call, here finally uh, getting back to you guys. Um, uh, thanks for your patience with this. Your questions are, have been, uh, I've gone through them and they look really great. And I look forward to hopefully answering a bunch of your questions. So um, without further ado, uh, we will get started. Uh, I have my uh, trusty assistant here with me on the other side of the camera, my son, Riley Lucente. Um, he's going to be asking me the questions. Okay, so we're going to get going right straight away. Go ahead, Ray. Hit me. Okay, well, that's a, that's a pretty easy question because actually when I was a child, which was a long time ago, um, in the 60s and 70s, um, I, didn't know, I didn't know what a property master was. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you didn't really have an idea of what a property master was before you started uh, studying about it. Quick answer to the question is, is that no, I never really always wanted to be a property master. Um, but uh, having said that, I mean, my, I'm not going to try to get too long into here because this could go on forever. But uh, I um, basically, you know, my father was a carpenter and my grandfather was a carpenter. And uh, my father was also a, music, a musician. Um, so uh, I had a lot of creativity in uh, my upbringing. And, uh, and my grandfather especially was a little bit of an inventor, invented a couple of different things. Um, you know, nothing that became big or anything, but it's just stuff around the house. And he was always tinkering with things. And my dad also being a, a carpenter installer and uh, a carpenter, um, we built, he built stuff all the time too. So, and you know, again, as children, we like to build things um, because it was a fun thing to do as Riley does to this day. So it's in his blood too. Um, so yeah, so that's the answer to that question is, uh, no, um, I didn't always want to be it, but I was always, I was teed up for it for when it do, did come along. Okay. Well, I guess again, my father and my grandfather being a carpenter and being using their hands and me um, doing that as well when I was a kid and getting it, uh, um, involved um, with building things was a key element to that. Um, also when I was younger I used to do a lot of collages. That was my medium that I liked to work in um, artistically. I cut things out of magazines and paste them all together. So again I, I had an aptitude for art. That was clear. Um, and so when I got into the film industry and, and started to see what the different jobs were and the different uh, crafts were in the film industry, again, like I said, I was definitely drawn towards the art department immediately. Um, so, but in props in particular, again, that didn't come till later. I, I actually worked in the art department in set dressing for many years before I got into props. Um, and what spoke to me about props, what really interested me in props was, first of all, it was what the, it's the only position really that is an onset position. When I say onset, I mean when you're actually filming, you know, because most of the time the art department, the set dressers and the production designer and the art director and all those people, they're all lead people. They're all people who help design the look of the sets. And, and it's all done prior to us filming and everything gets um, uh, designed and dressed and built before the shooting crew gets there. And then it, they turn the production, the set over to the shooting crew and we actually start filming. And that one person who is on set from the, the representative from the art department is the property master. Okay, great. So, um, so some of the skills that I just, determined or that I saw about a prop master that I was going to have to call on was again being able to think on my feet very quickly and to be able to um, adapt to whatever the situation was. So the skills that that I see that uh, were highly artistic is a is a very uh, good skill to have being able to um, to adapt to change and and make things happen 
in a timely fashion is another great skill to have. Just and having a great attitude, really, to be able to just, you know, what you know, because they throw all kinds of crazy curveballs at you. My my mantra is always when they ask me for something is how long do I have? Okay, because everything's about time in filmmaking, and so. You know, you have to know how much time you have to make it happen, and then you crank it out and make it happen, and and you're, you know, they love you for it whenever you make it happen. Making a movie is a, a lot like war, in, except you don't get killed most of the time. Um, but it's about a small group of people working collectively um, at the height of their um, expertise to get something done in, a sh in an amount of time that's ridiculous in the real world. When you watch a film, you're watching what's happening inside the little box, but there's a whole world outside that little box that is making what you're seeing happen. Um, and when, when and if you get an opportunity to go to an actual film set, you'll be astounded by what it looks like there because when you look in the monitor that's on set and you see what you're seeing, you think, oh yeah, that's what I watch on TV. And then when you, but when you look around, you, it, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors for the most part. And there's so many people involved in making that happen. Um, uh, so adaptability is being able to, see, I swung it back around. <laughs> adaptability is being able to um, move with all the changes and to keep things going you know and again when changes happen because somebody has a better idea or something looks good or something happens and it messes up or a prop breaks or whatever you have to be able to to change it really quickly so yeah. the adaptability part is is that and what and this is what makes it import, important is is that everybody has to have an attitude of of succeeding and of moving the project forward and having a good attitude about it because things change all the time and you can't get stuck saying, oh, well, that wasn't talked about or we weren't supposed to do that or that's not what was supposed to happen. It's about what we do, what are we doing now, how do we fix it, and how do we keep moving on. just talked about creativity and how important it is it's it's everything um, in the business itself and also in props as well because a lot of times directors and writers they write things they don't really know what they want in particular so they'll write very uh, basic information about it and then it's part of my job to help to, to collaborate with them to try to fine-tune what those things actually are a writer or, or especially a director they have so much going on in any given film it's not just the props and the sets and the locations it's the actors and casting and in everything in the in the camera angles and they have so much on their plate it's incredible so again that's why it's a collaboration that's why I look at the job like I'm here to help define what these props are to help motivate the story and define the characters. Those are the two things in particular that I think that props is the, the key to a great prop is. Um, so, so in answer to the question, yes, I do get to uh, add interpretation a lot. Often and most of the time, you know, when you come up with a prop, if say a prop is a, a watch for somebody, you can't just show them one watch and say, hey, here's this great watch I have, what do you think? You have to show them a lot of different choices because again, often, more often than not, they don't really know what they want until they see it. So to get to the second part of your question, which is about a prop that I um, helped to develop um, and had input in on Once Upon a Time in, a, in Hollywood. Okay, Quentin Tarantino knows what he wants, okay? He, he has thought about whatever it is I may be thinking about five times already. I mean, he knows his script and his story and his characters inside out and upside down. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but Pulp Fiction, there's three s distinct stories that happen and all these characters collide um, throughout the story. But when Quentin first wrote um, Pulp Fiction, he wrote a feature-length film for all three of those stories. Okay, and then consolidated it into one. So he knows everything about all those characters and, and, and what he's filming. 
before, way before he gets there. On the reverse of that, I've worked on shows before where I'll say, so this character, is he married? And the director will look at me like, huh, and he's never thought of it before. It's like, wow, okay. So, you know, that's the dichotomy of the two. Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, again, I just have to say, because we're talking about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood now, this was, this is the most amazing project I've ever worked on. Not just because it's Quentin Tarantino, because it was 1969 Hollywood. Again, I grew up in the 60s, in Hollywood in the 60s. I mean, who who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, because again, a period film, when you work on a period film, it's a whole different thing. Okay, because you're finding things that, you know, don't sometimes don't exist anymore or it's hard to find them and you have to, you know, do a lot of research, you know, which is the other great part of what I do is research. Okay, that's the fun part because again with props, you're getting into the lives of people um and living them because and they may do all kinds of different things. You could be working with a guy who's a mechanic, you could work with a guy who's a neurosurgeon. And so you have to l- learn auto mechanics and you have to learn neurosurgery, you know, to a certain extent, you know, to know what these people have and what they do and what they have in their life. So um, on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, remember Rick Dalton from the movie, played by Leo DiCaprio? Well, he had that uh, um, real to real tape recorder. Okay, and originally, in the, in the original script, it was a cassette recorder. And uh, so I started researching and finding cassette recorders. And in 1969, there were cassette recorders, but not many. I mean, there was, I think there were like one or two of the first cassette tape recorders out there. So in my researching, I realized that more than likely, Rick Dalton, because he's been an actor for a while... He, and he does this uh, routine of reading his lines into a tape recorder and playing them back so he could learn his lines. He's been, probably been doing this for a while, so he probably would have a reel-to-reel tape recorder and not a cassette recorder. So I had a meeting with Quentin. I said, hey, Quentin, I was thinking that um, on this tape recorder, and before I, it came out of my mouth, he goes, yeah, 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 I think it should be a reel-to-reel. And I was like, yeah, exactly, that's what I was thinking too. So we were on the same page about that, which was great. Um, so then I got to, you know, take off and try to, f- and get the real to real tape recorder and find a great real to real tape recorder. So I found this, uh, tape recorder, um, online and it turns out when I did the research on it, that it was one of the models of the tape recorder that they used in Mission Impossible. So I also know that Quentin, as you know, is, loves history and loves the history of filmmaking and television and the man is a walking encyclopedia. I mean, he knows everything about everything. It's insane how much he knows. And he would entertain us throughout the day with all of his stories and his knowledge about film and television. Sometimes we would go, he'd go on for 45 minutes. Nonetheless, I got to tell him about this tape recorder and said that it was the one used in Mission Possible, and of course he loved it. The second thing that I will um, share with you is the uh, mouse trap. Okay, I don't know if you remember the scene when um, Cliff Booth goes out to Spawn Ranch and he goes to George Spawn's house and he walks in his house. Um, it's a very tense situation and and as soon as he walks in the front door, he you know he takes in the whole of the house, which is an incredibly dressed set by the fabulous Nancy Haig, the uh, production de- uh, uh, set decorator on the movie. Oscar winning now. Well, no, she's a nine-time Oscar winner now. That was her ninth Oscar. That's how amazing of a set decorator she is. Um, And he looks off to his left, and there in the corner is a rat in a trap, stuck in a trap. And I don't know, it, it, it it meant something symbolic for Quentin, something that had to do with Cliff Booth and his journey. But it was something that he was adamant about that he mentioned to me early on to the point of where he actually had a fake animatronics rat made to be struggling in that scene. So he came to me and we talked about it and he was like, yeah, 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 he needs to be, and it was in the script too, rat and a glue trap. And then immediately when I read that, I thought, hmm, glue trap, 1969. I don't think so. So I did my research on it and uh, sure enough, the glue trap wasn't invented until 1984. 
that's a big stretch. I mean, there were a couple things in the movie where, you know, it was a year or two in either direction, you know, you could just fudge it a little bit and it didn't matter, but that's a big jump for me. So, you know, I had a, a conversation with Quentin about that and I was like, so Quentin, you know, uh, I don't know if you know, but the glue trap wasn't invented until 1986. I said, so, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, a big gnarly, you know, snap trap is the way to go. And he's like, nope, nope, it needs to be a glue trap. I'm like, well, it doesn't matter to you that it wasn't, period? He goes, no, it doesn't matter to me. I was, he goes, it needs to be a glue trap. Didn't explain to me why, but then again, he's the director, and my question, my job is not to ask him why, but to give him what he wants. I mumbled yeah. around in my head for a while, trying to figure out how I was going to approach this. And I ordered the glue traps. They came in, and of course, they're plastic. Okay, and then there's the glue on them. And I thought, this is just all wrong. It just doesn't look right at all. So I had this brainstorm that came to me. I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll take the glue trap, and then I'll, I'll build a wooden frame for it. And, and then I put that glue trap inside that wooden frame. And in my head, what I said to myself was, because, again, my grandfather was an inventor, I thought, well, maybe George Spawn created the first glue trap and never really marketed it or anything. And I'm like, I can live with that. Who knows? Maybe put a bunch of, you know, maple syrup or honey in there. Who knows what's holding that rat in there. As long as it doesn't look plastic, it'll be great. So that's what I did. And it was great. I mean, on camera, I don't, I, and I don't think, I don't believe anybody ever pointed that out, that there wasn't a glue trap in 1969. So that worked. Okay, well, great. We just touched base on a lot of those uh, of issues in the last question so what I could add to that again I could exp expound a little bit more on the research part of what I do and especially for like if we're, we're talking and, and that you recognize is 1969 requires a lot of research I did probably altogether nine months of research for this film I, I will just say that the minute I knew that there was a possibility that I could be on this film, I started doing research. Again, not having read the script yet, I just started doing research in 1969 Hollywood. Okay, so a lot of film, a lot of television, and a lot of music. I researched a lot of music. I thought for sure there was going to be a lot of the er music of the era, since it was such a huge part of 1969. Um, as it turned out, as you know, most of the music that was in the film was a soundtrack. Uh, we didn't really follow anything about the music of uh, 1969. Um, and leading up to my interview, what they did is they had me come in to read the script, okay, which was an incredible experience in and of itself, okay, because this was a dense 140 page script. I was devastated after reading that screenplay. I mean, I walked out of there, you know, in a state of shock um, by just how overwhelmed I was not only by the script but by the the amount of work that it was going to take to do this but at the same time I was also thrilled because now I knew what I could fine tune my research for and I think I read the script in October and I met with Quentin in like four weeks later I think it, what it was so I jumped headlong into research at that point knowing that I was had to research the Mansons and uh, television and westerns and and uh, um, Hollywood Boulevard and all of those things. Um, so, so when I went into my interview with Quentin, and mind you, by the time I was done, I had 500 photographs is what I walked into my meeting with. And I had planned it all out. I had planned out my interview from beginning to end of like how I was going to start the interview which, with pointing out to him that I had worked with him before. Uh, which was on Alias. But you may not know that Quentin Tarantino um, starred in two episodes and directed two of them, I believe it was. Um, and in it, his character had this like canister of, of nitrous oxide that he would just take hits off of, um, kind of like uh, David Lynch. Um, 
and uh, there were, and then he had all these different guns as well. So what I did is I went back and I found these photographs of Quentin on Alias, and I printed them out. So when I started my interview, um, I had those ready for. I said, just so you know, I said we've actually worked together before. And he goes, really? And I slid the picture across the table at him. And he's like, oh my God, I remember that, and blah blah blah. And he goes, that was great, and. You know, so that's how I started the interview. Then the second thing I did that I don't normally do in an interview, as you know, when you go to an interview, you have to bring your resume. Um, so I brought my resume, um, but normally, obviously, as you know, your resume is a list of text. Okay, so what I did for my resume is, is that I took the movie poster or television uh, photograph the, of each of the film's and television shows I worked on, and I put that on my resume as a photographic reference to it. So it ended up my resume was like 30 pages long, but nonetheless, he enjoyed it. He loved it. So then we got into the crux of all of the different research, and I, we, my interview was like an hour and a half, I think it was, and uh, and at one point, finally, he got overwhelmed by all the photographs that I was showing him, and. He was just, okay, okay, I, I've seen enough, I've seen enough. And because I, you know, I showed him so many different things and he saw that I was totally passionate about everything that I had been researching. And, uh, and he even said to me at the end, which this is a great moment for me, where he said, that's like the greatest presentation I've ever seen. And I could tell you for sure, if I'd never got that movie, that interview with Quentin Tarantino would have been enough for me. Three different props that I can identify with immediately is her dog carrier that she had in the airport and her luggage that she had as she came through the airport and the last thing was her her glasses that she wore in the theater when she was watching her movie um, so the dog carrier was the most challenging one for me um, because again when I was researching uh, Sharon and Roman coming through airports there was another photograph I saw where she was carrying this bag um, and again this is a black and white photograph this was the other challenge that we had a lot of photographs in 1969 were black and white and we're shooting in color so you know you, we you don't necessarily know what the color of everything is um, so you either have to make it up or do try to do more research but uh, um, but nonetheless so she was carrying this bag that looked like it was leather and some sort of uh, floral print tapestry um, and I, I ID'd that and I thought that's an interesting bag but then I was looking at a book about Sharon Tate written by her sister Deborah Tate and in it was that same photograph but down at the bottom in the description of it uh, Deborah Tate had written this is Char Sharon and Roman walking through the airport with their dog Dr. Saperstein and I was like, oh my God, it's a dog carrier. That's insane. Because the dog's in the movie. So I thought, oh my God, I have to get that bag. So launching into the research, I could not find that bag anywhere. No other reference to that bag. Um, I had no idea. I assumed it was some kind of designer bag, but I couldn't find it. Nothing. I couldn't find it anywhere. And I just had to have that bag. And then, long story short was is that I I found a bag maker. I found somebody who would actually build that bag for me based on photographs. At the end of that story is, I mean, the bag came up beautiful. I mean, they did such a beautiful job building this bag. Um, and Quentin loved it as well. And he's got it now at home. Um, but the other part of the, the end of the story of this bag was is that after we had built it and actually after filming it and everything, um, the costume designer Ariana Phillips sent me an email saying hey I was just at this pre-auction for some of Sharon Tate's stuff and look what I found and she sent me a picture of the bag <laughs> they act Deborah Tate actually had the bag and it, and, it, and it was also a color photograph so I got to actually see the actual color of the bag and I personally I mean again I'll see if I could drum up that picture for you and send that as well um, but uh, I, I, I personally like the uh, 
the tapestry, the fabric that I found um, for the bag better than the original. Speaking of uh, suitcases in the same scene, there's you see the luggage coming down off the carousel. Again, I found this uh, Paisley uh, tapestry Hartman suitcases on eBay, again, that were from the 60s that just, to me, just spoke of Sharon Tate's personality. And, um, and I fell in love with those bags and I showed him the Quentin and he loved them as well. And they were fantastic and I was so happy in the film when Quentin actually shot them coming down off the carousel. Um, so that was a great moment. It's always great when, you're, when your props actually show up on screen because often they don't. So that was beautiful. And then the last thing was her glasses, you know, that she wore in the theater, which, you know, I'm sure you remember that because they were huge. I don't know, again, why Quentin wanted those glasses so big, but he was adamant about them being big. And I probably showed him 30 pair of glasses before we finally got ones that were big enough for what he wanted for that scene. And at the time, I thought, these just look ridiculous. <laughs> they are so ridiculously big, but somehow they worked. You know, and you know the, the master Quentin Tarantino's mind. Um, he knew, and I, I think part of it was is that her watching her movie, you see it reflected off of those giant uh, glasses, and you know, and it was also a moment of vulnerability too for this beautiful movie star to be in the theater by herself with her stupid, you know, oversized glasses that she had to wear. It, it, it created a little bit more vulnerability for her. Um, and I think it really, at the end of the day, worked really well. Um, that's a really good question. Um, this happens a lot uh, in film, uh, especially with props, because of course it's a, a symbol. Props are often a symbol of different things. Um, so, but in this case, I, I think that that's true, um, because for Rick Dalton, the flamethrower represents a point in his career where he was peaking, and then uh, everything happened to him. The the slowing down of his career and the shifting of it and the questioning of everything and then in the end um, he is able to use that that flamethrower to um, regain some of his his old glory and which is all culminated with at the very end um, him having that conversation with Jay Sebring about the flamethrower and him telling him about it. And I think that was kind of what, what motivated uh, Jay Sebring to invite him up to the house to meet Sharon Tate, which was the long walk up the hill to him making it to his next uh, level of fame with, in Hollywood. Um, again, when I read the script for this movie, that end scene, it's scripted, he goes behind his bar and comes back with his six shooter from his Bounty Law days that he had and shoots the uh, Manson girl with his, uh, his Colt 45. And it was when I was in my interview with Quentin and we, were, and we were talking about that scene where he said, you know, I'm actually thinking about it might be cool to have a uh, have Rick come out, go into his pool house and come out with a flamethrower and light her up. And I was like, oh my God, you have to do that. That's like the best thing ever. That would be so funny. We did it. And, uh, and, uh, and when I saw it come out in the revisions, I thought, oh my God, this, this is going to be the best scene ever. And it was, it was great. <laughs> That's a great question, and um, you know it varies um, a lot. But for the most part, um, I'm always in communication with the actors um, regarding the props. Um, so, and again, some actors they don't care about props at all, and, and they'll just take whatever you give them. Um, but the best actors I find are the ones who really are interested in the props. And and again, some more than others. 
but uh, I work pretty closely in almost every project um, I involved with with the actors with the props I'll sit with an actor and we'll talk about the different props specifically for their character um, not necessarily story props as much but sometimes that as well but mostly their personal um, uh, property that they would have their uh, objects um, and then I will always take those notes and go back to the director and say this is what Leo's thinking about for this because you never want to get into a situation where the actor is calling for stuff that the director doesn't want in your so I've learned over the years to make sure that I'm including every all the creative people in that process because again you know the director and the actor may have different views about certain things and so if I alert everybody about it then I just gently push it in their direction for them to figure it out and then let me know what they want to do um, you know and at that point you know I could have a discussion with, and talk about um, my ideas for the props too some people are more open to it than others um, on uh, once upon a time in Hollywood one of the things was that Brad wanted to have some business you know just for his character and so we had talked about him having some certs mints and that he would take those and pop them every once in a while but somewhere along the way and I'm not sure exactly where this happened but Leo found out that he was doing that and then he decided he wanted to do it and I think Brad just let him have it and uh, so we actually had to find these certs mints I found some vintage ones online um, and we so we had the actual packaging because again it, this packaging for search mints was metallic you know it had this uh, metallic quality to it so having us to be able to print those things with that metallic printing would have taken a lot of effort so instead of trying to recreate them we used real um, vintage search mints Leo also decided that his character should have a drinking problem that was kind of one of the things that Leo brought to the character. So the only time he actually ended up using the search is when he got out of the car, when he's going to uh, um, to work on the set, and when he that's when he also had his fantastic um, uh, reel to reel bag. There was a um, a case that that reel to reel tape recorder came in that had this hair bone uh, tweed. Uh, cover on it and in with leather and it just happened to work out so perfectly that the costume Matched that bag perfectly. So it was like the perfect accessory to his wardrobe um, But it was in that scene where he was getting out of the car going to work where he popped the search So you couldn't really tell but I knew it was there if you look for it, you'll see it So that was pretty cool perfect. That's an actually great question. I love that question um, because uh, uh, we tend to stay focused on um, on the foreground action. You know, at least that's our priority. I always tell my crew, you know, whatever's happening inside that little box, meaning the monitor, you know, which is the frame of the camera, that's what that's the most important part. Because, like I said, when you're on a film set you see that what's inside that little box is what you're focused on, but the world is so much bigger outside of it. Okay, because you could be on a city street, and there could be hundreds of extras, as there were in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, all on the sides, you know, and what they do is they'll set people up, like on a street scene, on either end of the block or on the sidewalk, and they'll just keep walking them back and forth. They'll cross, there's a, a, a assistant directors, who cue these people to walk so there's always somebody walking in the background and uh, keeping everything moving or like at the scene in Musso and Frank's when they're eating dinner you know there's all those people back there and they all are doing something you know and again with Quentin everything had to be real um, you know 1969 everybody smoked cigarettes so we had a lot of cigarettes um, and we were constantly slinging cigarettes on that on that movie and again Quentin didn't want people just holding a cigarette that wasn't lit he goes if you have a cigarette I want you smoking it okay and then again we had a hundred different people in that scene and they were all eating in the background so we had to have real food and in fact we had more most all the food in that scene was all background 
Okay, because our heroes at the table, Al Pacino and, and Leo, were not eating, they were drinking. But in the background, we had 100 people eating food, and it took us five days to film that scene. So we had to make sure that all that food was right, and it was edible, because again, Quentin wants people eating the food if, it's, if they're there with it. And, uh, you know, and that translates also to just normal, everyday, every film, where there's things happening in the background. For me, that's a kind of a pet peeve of mine. I really want to make sure that um, that the background is authentic. I mean, there's a couple things in particular that bug me, like when you see somebody walking down the street and they have a soft briefcase in their hand and there's nothing in it. I always make sure that things look real. And the other um, uh, pet peeve of mine is when people have coffee cups in their hand and you could tell that there's nothing in the coffee cup because they're talking and they're doing this all over the place and it's like whoa whoa wait a minute. just put water in there or something in that coffee cup um and i always tell my crew because i'm usually focused on the 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 actors in the foreground part of the scene i always tell my crew this is your opportunity to shine is playing with the background get creative i don't care what you do back there man just have fun with it you know so because it's a uh, it, it's a it's a very important part of of the whole prop experience in my opinion um, a lot of times you don't really see what's happening in the background, but when you do and it's something fun and interesting, it really stands out. Good question. That's a great question. Um, and you're spot on with it. I mean, it, 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 the weight of it is everything. Um, because... Filmmaking is a collaborative effort, okay? And without every moving part working at the optimal level, things fall, can fall apart very easily. Um, it is, it takes such a monumental effort of collaboration with everybody um, to get it done that there's no room for that, you know? And if you have that kind of volatile, abrasive personality, you don't really last long in this business. Um, you know, you really have to be willing to and want to work with people in, in a collaborative kind of manner uh, because again we you, you're working very close in very close quarters sometimes you know over long 12 14 hour days five days a week for up to six months i mean you know you work on a, a film you become a family with these people okay more sometimes more so than your own family you spend more time at work than you do at home you know, and just like with any family member, there are certain personalities that are more difficult than others. I personally pride myself on trying to find something good in everybody that I work with, no matter how difficult they are to me. So it's a lot of, it's, and I'll always say, and this is one of my other mantras, I could always whip a prop into shape, but it's working with the people that's the most difficult part. Whether it's my own crew or the other members of the crew, that's always the most difficult part about this process is having to work with everybody else because it's not a single solitary person. It's a massive collaboration of people working very intensely together. And now in particular on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that was a whole different set of circumstances than I've ever experienced in my life. And again, it's the Tarantino factor. Like I said, there's a lot of hurry up and wait in the film business where people are waiting for lighting or whatever the case may be, people sitting around all the time. And nowadays, everybody's in their cell phone. When I first started in this business, there were no cell phones. So people would bring magazines to set or a book or just talk to each other, okay? And that's kind of a lost art that's happened, you know, in the digital age where everybody's like in their phones at all times. But on a Tarantino set, that's not happening. So it was interesting to see how everybody was closer to one another because we all had to entertain each other during all this downtime. So we we got to um, you know interact with each other on a much closer level, and ultimately it made for a better project product because we were all focused on it. And the other part of that with Tarantino is is he has key people that had been with him since the beginning of his career. And it, they refer to themselves as the Tarantino family. Okay, they know how he operates and how he works, and they know what to expect from him, and he knows what to expect from them. 
and you know being the outsider coming into that um, was an amazing experience because I got a lot of people who came up to me and helped me with having to deal you know to deal with his personality and what he expects again Cindy Wall was a great help with that and a couple other key members of his his family who've been with him since the beginning who you know you know they know the routine and they taught it to me and again I've been doing this for 35 years I never experienced anything like working on a Tarantino set it was way different than anything else I've ever been in perfect That's a very interesting question. Um, like, I think that's something that usually the writer and the director will get into um, overall w um, before th we even get into production on something like that. As far as having an effect on the human mind, <laughs> I think props um, definitely do. I mean, because it, they're like, again, they're the normal things in life. So, you know, when if you see a character and you meet a character in a film and you're getting to know this character and they're regular and they're normal and the next thing you know they pull a gun out that's telling you something okay and that's going to have an effect on what you think about that character it's informing you something about the character and you have a psychological shift about that character so, yes so so props definitely help to set tone and uh and in invoke psychological emotions in people as far as working with psychologists I could tell you from a prop level we use what is referred to as tech advisors so like um, like on a police drama we use police uh, tech advisors where we actually consult with real cops they will tell us what's real what's not real and if I have questions about procedure I could call them up and they'll tell me what it is um, on a show like uh, uh, Body of Proof, which was uh, Dana Delaney played a medical examiner in the uh, city of Philadelphia. Um, we did, you know, we were in a coroner's office we, and we had all these dead bodies everywhere and we had to do autopsies all the time on camera. And uh, so we had a, uh, a tech advisor on that. Um, Gary Kellerman was his name. A really great guy who was in Los Angeles County Medical Examiner for real um, and he had been to many crime scenes and has had processed many dead bodies or as he would refer to as dead folk um, which I thought was very sweet because he was a very very sweet guy who had a very weird job <laughs> um, dealing with uh, dead people and, uh, and trying to figure out crime scenes um, so it's always interesting for me to be able to work with tech advisors on shows where I don't, you know, it's something new for me and it's a new field that I get to learn something about. So that's another great part of this. Show. There's a great collaboration between the costume designer and props because obviously clothes are something that's very personal to a character as well um, and there are certain gray areas that depending on who the costume designer is and who the property master is can go either way um, so it's important for us to get together on the same page you know like again all the clothes that an actor wears is the costume designers realm um, and they design all that they work with the actors just like I work with the actors some of the accessories like a watch or eyeglasses those are props if it's an accessory that has to match their wardrobe then I usually let the costume designer decide that sometimes the costume designer will come to me and say here's what I'm gonna put this person in can you find something that'll go with that but most of the time the costume designer wants to have that input um, you know, especially like with women with purses, purses are an accessory that has to match the wardrobe. It would be ridiculous for me to just go out and get some random purses when I don't know what they're wearing. Um, so most costume designers want to do that. But then like their briefcase or if they have a satchel or a backpack or something like that, that's props. Um, one of the other things was Brad wore those, uh, the bracelets, um, in the movie and he was
was very integral in picking those bracelets out. We, he worked with me and with uh, one of the costume people to fine tune exactly what that was that he was going to wear as far as that leather bracelet. Um, and then the la second part of this question was about the actors getting involved in it. Um, one of the things that happened in uh, the movie, in Once Upon a Time, was that uh, there was that transition scene or in the movie where they go to Italy and do all their westerns and then come back to the States after six months. And so we decided that it had this European Italian influence on them that they would have changed uh, somewhat over those six months. So it was actually Brad who came to me and he had these four pair of vintage sunglasses that he had gotten from somewhere. I don't even know where he got them from. And he says, I really like these and I think we should use them in the movie. And I'm like, great. Brought them to Quentin. Said, hey, Quentin, Brad came up these glasses. And he was like, great. He said, whatever they want, man, they look good to me. So we showed them to Leo. Leo picked a pair. Brad picked a pair. And the, that's the glasses that they wore when they were on the airplane coming back. And those came from Brad himself. So that was pretty cool. Well, I'd say that that's a, pro, uh, a, a common occurrence. It happens in two different ways. One, in which where you are completely prepared for the scene with the prop and everything, and then you come to the set and you bring in the prop, and then some, somehow in the last minute, either the writer or the director or the actor says, no, I want to do this instead. And then you come up, you hit them with the phrase, how much time do I have? And they tell you, and then you take off like a madman and try to whip this thing together and get it back to them in time um, before they start shooting. So that happens on, on a very regular basis. More so in television than in film, but it has happened in film. There's two things that I could tell you about that would be um, prominent. One just happened recently to me on this new show that I'm on. This is a scene where there was a giant ribbon cutting happening. And what happens is this mascot comes running down this, the sidewalk and hit, jumps on this mini trampoline with these giant scissors in his hand and lands right in front of Ted Danson. When the whole thing came up, I showed them a pair of, of scissors that were about probably 18 inches tall. And so I sent them these scissors. They approved them. I was like, great, I got that done got a backup pair, um, and we were good to go. Cut to uh, two days before we're filming this scene, they decide that uh, the scissors are too small, that they want bigger scissors. I'm like, okay. So I found different scissors. The problem was there's no way I was gonna be able to get them, get them to deliver it in time, and then have them make them safe for on camera. So, I went to one of our prop houses and found this giant pair of scissors. I picked up the scissors in the morning to bring them to set and uh, to show the, the stunt coordinator the scissors because she really wanted to see them now that it changed. And as soon as I picked them up, I knew they were too heavy because they were, they were pretty heavy and they were metal. So I brought them to set and she's like, no, no, no way, that's never going to work. I'm like, all right, fine. So I'm just going to use them as a template and have them build me some other scissors, uh, manufacture some safer scissors. And in a crunch time, my manufacturer made me two sets of scissors um, that were s safe. Now, here's the rub. <laughs> you know, I could make those scissors out of plastic, but because they're so big and they're running with them, they didn't want them flopping. The director said, I don't want them to look like they're a toy. I want them to look like they will actually cut the ribbon. So I had them make it out of plexiglass, which is like a plastic, and then they coated, they sandwiched them with um, sheet metal. Okay, so it would give them some more stability. Again, I picked them up, scheduled to pick up the day that they worked, the morning they worked. Of course, it was first seen up eight o'clock in the morning. I picked up the scissors at the manufacturer and I brought them to set. I took them out of the box and lo and behold, the 
stud corner looks at me she goes i'm sorry she said but they are still too dangerous they're too heavy i can't have him running and jumping with these scissors and so the first assistant director was standing there and i got there about a half hour before crew call so i can make sure we put this all to bed and i looked at him and i said how much time do i have and he said and i said realistically how much time do i have and he said a half hour and i'm like okay and so there I was with a half hour before filming the scene with no scissors. So what I did is I, I had this, this small pair, the original smaller pair that the uh, producers had a, approved originally and then decided they wanted them bigger. And I looked at them very quickly and realized that everything was screwed together with screws. So I said, fine. So I ran to my trailer because I have this giant 48 foot tractor trailer that has all the props in it and my workbench and everything in it, my shop as it were, my traveling shop. And I disassembled the scissors. And what I did is I took the blades of the scissors and I put them on some super heavy cardboard that I had. It's called, we call it show card. It's like mat board that you mat a frame for a photograph with. And uh, I, I traced the blades with pencil but then I extended it like another six inches so they were longer and subsequently bigger. And then I cut them out and then I did it again so I made it double thick because when I cut them out they were really wobbly. And then I got our painter who was standing by and he took them and sprayed them silver for me. And then I, I had to get different hardware because now they were different texture and they uh, you know the screws of the original ones screwed into the metal but now there's no metal so i had to use nuts and bolts and then we had to grind the ends of the bolts off and flatten them down so they were safe and in the meantime i'm listening on our walkie talkie as they're calling you know setting up the scene and then they're saying okay that's it we're about ready to shoot let's get hair and makeup in here for last looks on people and i'm still screwing this thing together putting it trying to get it together and then I finally I have the thing and I come running down to the set as they're calling for to to for us to roll camera and they had been using some cardboard tube to rehearse with or something not knowing if these things were going to show up what they were going to look like or whatever and they can, and I have to say they looked beautiful and I handed it to them and I said there's one we have one pair so be careful which was a crazy thing to say because they're made out of cardboard and the scene is a, a guy running down, jumping on a trampoline with this thing and landing on the ground. So the minute I gave it to him, my assistant on set looked at me and said, you're making another one, right? And I'm like, yes. So I had the second pair and I ran back to my trailer and I started the whole process all over again while they were shooting. And I finished the second pair in half the amount of time because I knew what I was doing at that point. And I walked back down the set with the second pair. And as I arrived on set, they they were just setting up for a take. And they did the take. And in the take, the, the scissors broke in half. And so I just picked up those broken ones. And I handed them the new ones. And they kept going. And they never knew what happened. Okay. And that is the magic of props. Is, is that you're, you're there. Things are there. They don't even know what's going on. All they know is that it's happening. Okay, and that's like the best day in a prop guy's life is when you're just like making it magic and they don't even know. Okay, you know, and that's what we strive for at all. Um, as you can imagine, um, because of the intensity of what we do, um, it can often get to a point where you lose your humor in trying to get something done really quickly. But overall, we keep trying to remind ourselves, and in fact, there used to be a pin that people wore that just said, it's only a movie. Uh, you know, because again, we're, it's not brain surgery what we're doing, we're, you know, we're making entertainment, you know, and we try to keep having fun with whatever we're doing, um, because Otherwise, why do it? You know, I mean, you're doing it for so many hours a day. If you're not having fun doing it, you should just go home because what happens is you just get burnt out and crabby and nobody wants to be around that. So um, we try to keep it light as much as we can. Uh, okay, a great um, 
story about making a prop funny was uh, I did a movie years ago called The Yearling, which was a remake of a famous uh, Disney movie uh, about, you know, set in the late 1800s, I think it was, uh, about a boy and his father and, a, and a, uh, his hunting dog and, uh, and, and this deer that he befriends. So while we're, we were filming it in, in the backwoods of South Carolina, okay, which is far away from Hollywood, okay, and sometimes, you know, you work on a film, it is in some remote location, which makes everything more difficult because you don't have the easy access of everything that Hollywood has for you. So here we are in the middle of nowhere um, filming these, these scenes, and the producers come to me and say, hey, we want to do this scene where the dog gets injured fighting the bear and the father has to carry the dog around his shoulder to uh, come home, uh, to bring the dog home. So can you look into finding a fake dog that uh, we could do that with? You know, and of course the dog has to match what our dog looked like to it. So I looked into it, made some phone calls to LA to see what was existing and available. Unfortunately, they were all either Dobermans or German Shepherds are the only ones that they really had in stock. So then it became about, well, what would it take to build one? And they were like, oh, $10,000 to build this fake dog. And this was a low budget movie. So they were like, there's no way we're paying that much money for this dog. I'm like, okay, well, these are your options. So they didn't want to deal with it. They just kept kicking the can down the road. And it came down to it, and we were coming to the end of filming this whole movie. And they were like, you got to help us. We have to do something. We have to film this scene. Listen, we're going to do it at dusk, and we're going to have them walking across the horizon with the sun, you know, behind him. So it's all going to be silhouette. silhouette. We just need something. We so need I went to my truck, and I said to my assistant at the time, who was my best friend, uh, Sprocket, his name is um, just an amazing guy and I said Sprocket T I said we need to build a dog and he was like great how much time do I have I'm like no time we need to build a dog it's gonna work probably later today and he's like all right fine he goes where's the dog there goes Sprocket he takes off and I see him down there and he's got a tape measure and he's like measuring the dog and measuring his height and his length and making all these notes and everything and then I see him out and he's like walking through the woods and he's picking up all these sticks and stuff I'm like I don't know what he's doing but I sure hope he's working on the dog and I came to the truck and I was like so T what do you got and he goes check it out and he t picks up this dog that he built out of a used a milk jug for his head and burlap and sticks that he had cut in put together so it was the exact shape and size of our real dog and with a tail and the whole nine yards and then he took it and he put it over his shoulder and draped it around his his over his shoulder and I was just stunned it looked just like the dog and it, you know obviously didn't have the detail but it, it hung perfectly like dog and we put it on the actor and we put him in front of that the camera and if you ever see The Yearling with Peter Strauss, there's a scene where he's walking across the sunset with the dog over his shoulder. And that dog's made out of sticks and burlap and a milk jug. And didn't you also play the bear? Oh, yeah, I did. I played the bear. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. You really were in a bear I did. Costume. I did have to play the bear at one point. Um, this bear fought with Peter Strauss in one scene. And our, uh, a f we had a real bear. They're a 10-foot grizzly bear, which is another whole story. But he clearly couldn't fight the real bear because he would have gotten killed. So they had brought these bear claws, these bear arms, these real bear arms that were on sticks, and they were doing this kind of action fighting him. And the director was like, no, 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 I need something more than that. I need to see more of the bear. I need to see more of the bear. What can we do? And I had a full real bearskin rug that I had purchased because I just thought well maybe we'll need it somewhere on this show and so what I did is I put the bear skin on me in the head over my head and then I had my assistant take safety pins and pin the skin around my arms and around my legs and I came on to set and I was like here you go I'm here and the director's like 
fantastic. Get in there. And so we actually filmed the scene, and I'm there's a scene where Peter Strauss is fighting with the bear, and it's me. Wow, that's a, that's a great question, too. Um, yes, in fact, Quentin, Quentin loves to bring stuff from one movie universe into the next one. That's like one of his favorite things to do. Red Apple cigarettes being um, the number one thing. I think you could probably find a Red Apple, pack of Red Apples in most of Tarantino's movies in one way or another. Um, the fun thing about the Cadillac was is that that Cadillac that was in Reservoir Dogs, he gave that Cadillac to Michael Madsen at the end of that movie as a thanks for his work on the movie. And then when Tarantino was doing this movie, Michael Madsen gave it back to him to use in the film. There are several different things that Quentin pulled out of his archives. And when I say archives, I mean warehouse. Okay, Quentin keeps everything from every movie he's ever done and I when I say everything I don't mean just the props I mean the props the wardrobe the sets it's part of his contract that he gets everything but for the most part the things that Quentin liked to to reuse were like a lot of his graphics again Red Apple he said to me when we started that I want I want to do a whole line of Red Apple okay and again I'm gonna send you a picture of me working on the red, we actually shot a red apple cigarette, a red apple tobacco commercial for this movie that someday will come out. Then we did an actual like product shot. We did a product commercial where we, I actually made, I think it was eight different products of red apple cigarettes, which was the, the shorts, the filters, the menthol, the tans, the chewing tobacco, the uh, pipe tobacco. Rolling papers. We did the whole nine yards. We did all of these different Red Apple um, uh, products, which Brad's character, Cliff, he smoked Red Apple. And here, here you go. See, I, I was able to maintain one of these packs, um, which was fantastic, because look at it. There it is in all of its glory. You, you never see a Red Apple um, product that close on camera, but uh, they're there. Um, there was a second one that um, called Capital W, and that's what Leo smoked, which again, I'll, th I'll throw up a picture of that product um, that was something that was in death proof in the background in, a, in the convenience store window. That in, a, in the beginning of the movie, he brought me all this product and all this advertisement that he had from his archives and said, I want to find places to use all this stuff in the film. So I made the cigarettes and we decided to then use them um, in it for Leo's character. Uh, the other thing was Old Chattanooga Beer. That was another one. And you saw Old Chattanooga Beer because that's what Cliff was drinking all the time when he was on the boat, when he was in the house, pulling cans of uh, Old Chattanooga Beer. That is also another product that came from Death Proof that was in the store window that you never saw. So I um, got to make these old Chattanooga beer cans, which, you know, the old pull tabs. There's a whole story. I could do another whole segment about uh, building all of these graphics and making all these old products. And again, if you could see the, the metallic in that can, I mean, I'm really proud of the work that we did on this can of beer. Um, the label for this was amazing. So... Again, that's an old throwback that uh, Quentin did for um, a lot of things that he likes to, he loves to draw that thread through all of his films. All right, well, I think that's it. I, I believe I answered all your questions um, and then some. So I hopefully that uh, uh, gives you a little bit more insight. I had a blast doing it. I had a blast doing it with my son, Riley. Come over here. No. Sorry, he said, I gotta do it. This is, here he is. That's my boy right there. He did a great job, kept me on track. Because the first time I did this, I tried to put this together once on my own, and it was a disaster, let me tell you. Um, so I'm really glad that I had him here to help me. Um, and it was. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, I don't have to tell you, other than, you know, if, if this sounds 
interesting to you, it's because it is. Um, I've never, never had a dull moment um, doing what I do in all these years, you know, and that's one of the beauties of it is, is that every project brings a different challenge and a different opportunities. I've been able to work, you know, in hospitals, in surgery rooms, in coal mines, a mile down in a steel mill, a working steel mill with 1500 degree furnaces blasting around me and you know in every all parts of this country got to work in different communities with local people um, understanding their culture and their in their habitat and um, it's just been a fantastic career I couldn't really uh, I'm blessed to have been able to do what I do um, in such a creative way and so I encourage anybody to pursue it because it is a lot of fun and, and it was an honor for me to be able to to tell you what I do. Stay safe out there um, and I hope that you guys could get back to uh, live classes soon and thanks Angela so much for this opportunity. I know she must be the best teacher so I, I'm, I'm happy that you guys got that opportunity with her. And, uh, I guess that's it for now. Um, if anybody has any other questions, I'm going to put my email address um, up with some of the information that we're going to cut all this together. Ryan and I are going to have a good time editing all this together. So that's it. Um, and uh, good luck in all your endeavors. Thanks. And we cut.